This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. My name's Richard Solly. I'm coordinator of London Mining Network, and I'm a member also of Columbia Solidarity Campaign. I'm going to be chairing this session on sustainable development. I visited Colombia for the first time in September and October 2000 and saw for myself the human effects of the forced displacement of a number of indigenous Wayu and Afro-Colombian communities for coal mining at the huge Serejón open cast mine in La Guajira. Some, like Media Luna, Oreganal, Cinco de Noviembre, had already been displaced. Others, like tobacco, were facing imminent displacement. It was for this reason that I joined Columbia Solidarity Campaign when it was set up early in 2001. Since that time, Columbia Solidarity Campaign has done its best to accompany those communities affected by the Serifon Mine which have asked for our support. It was in part because of the lack of change on the part of Serifon Coal that Columbia Solidarity Campaign worked with others in late 2006 to set up London Mining Network, which was launched in April 2007. I was especially moved when I visited La Guajira a second time in October 2001 and visited the community of tobacco again. In 2000, it had been a beautiful place where a community of small-scale farmers of African descent lived in well-constructed houses which they had built themselves, kept fertile gardens around those houses, ran goats and cattle on common land around the village, worshipped in a church which they had built themselves, sent their children to a school provided by the local authority, and had until recently had the services of a publicly provided clinic and communications centre. The village was bounded by a broad, clear, fast-flowing stream along which grew enormous, beautiful trees. In October 2001, the village was in ruins. Most of the houses had been bulldozed. The church had been wrecked. Many of the villagers were living in the school building, over the door of which they had proudly posted the United Nations Declaration on Human Rights. I visited again towards the end of 2002. I couldn't visit tobacco then. The destruction had been completed, the village and its fertile environs swallowed up by the mine, the inhabitants scattered among their friends and relatives in neighbouring towns or far away, living together in overcrowded homes. The attorney advising the local authority explained to us quite clearly why this had to happen. These people are primitive, she told us. They stand in the way of progress. If they insist on living by agriculture, they should seek waged labour on one of the enormous pineapple plantations we want to put in round here. So my question is, is this development, this destruction of community and independent living, is the advent of large quantities of money the only marker of development? ABC's excellent report notes that indigenous and Afro-Colombian views of development differ sharply from the model being pursued by companies and national government. Based as they are, it says, on meeting basic necessities from their lands, the protection and respect of environmental resources, the ecological capital in indigenous cultures, tend to be central issues. This cosmovision of development is in conflict with the current model of development and public policies of the Colombian state that are orientated towards the intense industrial exploitation of natural resources. Why should communities' views be systematically ignored? Why is one version of development consistently preferred over others? Where is this dominant model of development leading? For whose benefit is it being pursued? Why do those who oppose it live in fear? Why do community leaders demanding justice from mining companies receive threats? This is what we need to consider in this session. And for the sake of honesty, so that it's clear where I stand, or sit in this case, in case it wasn't already, 
Columbia Solidarity Campaign and London Mining Network in general stand unequivocally with impacted communities calling for respect for their rights in the face of the often brutal imposition of a development model which they do not accept. Our role is not to seek a middle way. It is to amplify the voices of communities resisting mining or calling for justice from mining companies or demanding decent wages and working conditions in the mines and to continue our solidarity until their victory or our death, whichever happens first and which might happen before the end of this afternoon given the temperature in the room. <laughs> but, but I hope not.